possibly the most explosive idea ever to have blown the minds of any century was the 19th century explosion, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Because Darwin at one stroke answered what must have seemed the biggest problem of all to many people. Why do we exist? Why are we here? Why are living things so numerous, so varied, so complicated, so elegant? And why do they have such a powerful illusion of design? Today I want to apply the idea that Darwin gave us in 1859 to a particular field, namely doctoring. Should doctors be Darwinian? Everybody should be Darwinian because, as I've said, Darwinism is what explains our own existence and what could be more exciting than that. But there are reasons to think that doctors, in particular, need to be more aware of Darwin's idea than they are at present. I'm not a medical doctor, uh, and I um, defer to those, in the, there may be some in the audience who, who are. Um, I'm very aware that doctors get fed up with being told how to do their job by their patients and others, um, patients who have walked into the doctor's office having looked up their symptoms on the internet and diagnosed themselves uh, what might be called cyberchondriacs. <laughs> but I do think that uh, Darwinian evolution does have something to offer the medical profession. After choosing my title, Should Doctors Be Darwinian?, I realized that it was vulnerable to a bad misunderstanding, which I have to get out of the way immediately. Um, it might be thought that Darwinian medicine, which is what I'm talking about, meant um, letting people die so as to improve the genetic quality of the race or, or something of that sort. Um, that's nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about how doctors can learn to be better doctors through understanding uh, Darwinian natural selection. I'm going to plug a book uh, called Darwinian, well, it isn't called Darwinian Medicine. It ought to be called Darwinian Medicine. The authors, Randolph Nessie and George C. Williams, wanted to call it Darwinian Medicine, but their publishers in America wouldn't let them because they thought the word Darwinian would be off-putting to would-be purchasers. I can't imagine why. But the publishers changed the title to Why We Get Sick. A very silly title indeed. Um, if you are trying to sell a book to doctors, as they were, because they wanted to educate doctors, the last thing you should call your book is Why We Get Sick. Doctors think they already know that. Uh, you have to put into the title something about what's special about this book, which is, of course, Darwinism. Then the problem arose that the title Why We Get Sick couldn't be exported to this country. Because in this country, why we get sick would mean why we throw up, rather than just why we get ill. And so in Britain, the book was renamed Evolution and Healing, which in anything, if, if anything is even worse, because it suggests homeopathy and faith healing and laying on of hands and, and that kind of thing. Um, the book, as I say, ought to be called Darwinian Medicine. That is in the subtitle. Um, but under any title, I recommend it. And you'll find a recommendation on the cover from me, which says, buy two copies and give one to your doctor. What is Darwinian medicine? Well, it takes the approach that both the patient and the pathogen, the parasite, are under the influence of Darwinian natural selection and therefore, what you're looking at as a doctor may very well be understandable in a Darwinian way, perhaps as an adaptation to something. It might not be an adaptation. It might just be a plain, boring byproduct of the pathogen's activity. So tooth decay, dental caries, 
uh, is probably, uh, it's caused by bacteria, but it's probably not in itself an adaptation by the bacteria or by the patient. It's just a boring byproduct. But it could be an adaptation for the good of the pathogen. And there are some spectacular examples of parasites manipulating their hosts in order to get themselves passed on to the next host. As you probably know, many parasites go through a life cycle in which they parasitize one species, perhaps an insect, uh, or perhaps a worm, and then another species, perhaps a, a mammal, perhaps a sheep or something, and there may even be a, a third or fourth host in their life cycle. And they have to get going round and round in this life cycle. And a lot of their adaptations are adaptations to get passed on to the next stage in the life cycle. And a particularly beautiful example is the so-called brain worm, which is a little tiny fluke whose final host is a sheep, but whose intermediate host is an ant. And so an early stage in the life history of the fluke, this worm, has to get from the ant into the sheep. And the way it does it is that the sheep inadvertently eats the ant when eating grass, because the ant is sitting on the grass. In the heat of the day, it would be the normal custom of ants to go down into the ground, rather than be up on the grass stems where sheep might eat them. What this so-called brain worm does is it burrows into the brain of the ant and makes a lesion in the brain of the ant which changes the behavior of the ant in a crucial way. The ant, which has this brain lesion, instead of going down into the ground in the heat of the day, instead climbs to the top of the grass stems. And there, of course, it's vulnerable to being eaten by sheep, which is just exactly what the parasite needs. Such adaptations for the good of the parasite may be quite common and may be the kind of thing that doctors ought to look out for, and I'll come on to that. Or the symptom that you're looking at could be an adaptation for the good of the patient. Vomiting might be an adaptation by the patient to sick up and get rid of the parasite, or it might be an adaptation for the parasite to get passed on, who knows. The symptom might be an adaptation for both. For example, um, diarrhea with certain diseases. Uh, this might be an adaptation for the benefit of the patient because it gets rid of the parasite, but it also might be an adaptation for the good of the parasite because, say, it gets into the water supply or something of that sort. Now, when we talk about adaptation, when we talk about things being for the good of something, remember that in the Darwinian world, individuals don't care about their species or their group. Natural selection favors individuals that work for their own survival, and more particularly, that work for the survival of the genes that make them do uh, whatever it is they do. So um, it's quite plausible that diarrhea could benefit both the host, getting rid of the pathogen, and benefits the pathogen, getting it into the water supply. But you have to remember that we're not talking about benefiting the whole species of parasite, or the whole species of host for that matter. What we're talking about is strictly benefiting the individual's genes who cause the symptom that we are talking about. In this particular case, if, it, if the adaptation is for the benefit of both the patient and the host, you might say then, who is the loser? And the answer is the next host, which is what the adaptation is all about from the point of view of the parasite. It's getting itself into the next host. Something like the brain worm getting itself into the sheep, uh, but possibly less dramatic. Coughing, similar story, when you cough, you expel the pathogens that have given you the cough and thereby endanger other people who may inhale the droplets. From the point of view of the parasite, this is for their own good. It's for the good of the parasite to make you cough. 
And so a cough might be regarded as an adaptation by the uh, parasite, or it might be regarded as an adaptation for the good of the patient uh, because it, gets, it helps to get rid of the, the pathogen. Once again, it could be for the benefit of both. These are the kinds of speculations, or more than speculations, which you'll find in this book on Darwinian medicine. And the authors, Nessie and Williams, are very clear that they're not trying to say in every case what the answer is. They're simply trying to get doctors to think in these terms, to ask the Darwinian question. And in some cases, this could be uh, quite surprising. When a patient gets a high temperature, gets a fever, most doctors would probably try to find ways to reduce the fever, to reduce the temperature, because it's unpleasant, uh, it's a symptom, it's abnormal, the temperature is different from the normal one, so give the patient a pill or some other treatment which reduces the temperature. But that could be the wrong thing to do. Um, if the high temperature is simply a boring byproduct, then fine, bring the temperature down. But if, on the other hand, the high temperature is an adaptation by the patient to make life difficult,